the cost of dealing with a data breach was prohibitive. That statement from San Diego-based Impairment Resources LLC is the most succinct explanation of how data breach can result in a company's bankruptcy. Impairment Resources lost detailed medical and personal records of more than 14,000 people. The company would have been, been more fortunate if thieves had come in and taken physical assets. But the liabilities relating to the loss of electronic medical records were more than the company could absorb. It filed for Chapter 7 liquidation barely three months after the break-in. Due to a growing liability threat that comes from this exposure, a strong commitment to data protection is not simply an internal policy, but a huge threat to a business's viability and now a prerequisite to secure new business for organizations. Data security improperly administered is a real liability that in some cases can pierce the corporate veil into personal liability for corporate officers. High stakes indeed. Today's discussion will be about confronting, managing, and protecting in the business world, changing laws and expectations, with data security and privacy protection. And most importantly, what all companies must do to keep up with them regardless of their size. We will present perspectives from the C-suite business leader side, as well as from the dark defense world of cybersecurity teams working the mission to protect their companies, protect and defend their companies. The reference of cybersecurity in a military context is intentional, as today's business find themselves on the defense in this battle. Make no mistake about it, a true cyber war has begun in earnest on, uh, on the internet, the internet of things, and the pervasive growth of portable data has grown exponentially. Both sides are working hard to obtain the lucrative high ground in this interconnected world provides. To offer a hands-on perspective of both the C-suite challenges as well as the warfighting attitude needed to counter this challenge, I cannot think of a more qualified authority on the topic than Ken Barnhart, today's expert for this webinar. Ken is the former CEO of the Ockham Group, and is currently serving as the founder and principal consultant for High Ground Cyber. Ken has over 25 years of experience in cybersecurity and cloud strategy. He sits on several advisory boards and working groups and also serves as the chairman of the board for the Center for Cyber Resilience. For more than a decade, Ken has helped companies of all sizes design, host, and secure environments in private, public, and hybrid cloud models. What makes Ken even more qualified is his training and service that he had early in his career. Prior to his work in the corporate sector, Ken served as a non-commissioned officer in the United States Marine Corps. And as a, as a decorated combat veteran of Operation Desert Seal, Desert Storm, for the HQ Battalion of the 2nd Marine Division. As you will hear in our discussion, Ken brings both the corporate C-suite defense perspective, as well as the aggressive offensive marine strategies of war fighting against a very determined enemy. I think it will become clear to you that Ken takes this security challenge very seriously. And I expect after today's discussion, you will too. Ken, welcome to the PRP Cybersecurity Webinar. Pleasure to be here, Bob. Number five. Well, Ken, let's, let's start with some context here. We all have heard about some of the large data breaches of uh, like Equifax, Target, Anthem, and the exponential growth of big data and the mass rollout of the of IoT things, of devices. So how large a threat is this, and is it growing? Uh, it's absolutely growing, Bob. I, I think it's helpful to uh, look at this at the global level first uh, before we start to kind of drive down into even the United States perspective or a particular sub-segment of the U.S. economy. Uh, at a global level, the statistic, the last full set of stats we have is from 2015. Uh, 2016 and 17 are still being compiled and getting global numbers takes longer. Uh, but cybercrime and cyber espionage uh, at a global level in 2015, we know that was the cost for in excess of $500 billion. Uh, General Alexander, former head of the U.S. Cyber Command, uh, testified before Congress that uh, intellectual property theft uh, from U.S. corporations uh, was what he called the greatest single wealth transfer in the history of humankind. Uh, analysts that I've talked with uh, are estimating that 2017 
the global losses will probably exceed one trillion. Uh, so this is this is if, to put that in context. That's like more than the gross domestic product of some European countries, uh, smaller nation states. The graph on the right here kind of tells the other part of the story is that uh, despite increased awareness and what I would think would be fairly uh, characterized as record investment in this issue, we've seen a, a 27 and a half percent increase in 2017 in the costs of these in US dollars. And putting that in more of a longer term perspective, the last five years, that's a 62% increase uh, despite you know the significant investment. What what the bottom line, what that's telling us is that while the white hats are getting better uh, at protecting data, the black hats are just getting better at stealing it much faster than we're getting better at protecting it. Uh, we, there's there's no doubt we are losing this fight, uh, especially in the small and mid market. Uh, that's for the area where we're seeing a lot of really heavy damage being done right now. Well, I can see how large organizations are, are tar targets for financial data, but what are the implications to small for the small to mid-market companies? And are these really targets for black hat attacks? Uh, the perception is that uh, ink uh, equates to actual realized reality. Uh, for two examples, I, hit, I, I put on the slide here, Target in 2013, it lost over 120 million records in 48 hours of the breach that was really kind of a high freak out factor there the street had never seen that capital loss uh, working capital on the street was about 70 percent end of january people would calm down uh, it was only down about 10 percent the end of 20 uh, february 2014 the stock was back up above pre-breach levels uh as a kind of another example and roughly the time same time period that was a uh, second third time this has happened uh, of the major breaches Home Depot spent about, they lost about 65 million customers. They spent 62 million bucks. The stock dropped by 10% for about a month. And then they came out with the third fiscal quarter, showing they had a really strong earnings per share and their stock was up 21%. Uh, the enterprise reality, the Equifax event, all these other stuff, uh, it's a PR problem, right? They're at 60, 90 days. They can ride out the storm and fuse some capital, uh, emergency stock box if they have to. The other really common thing we see in the playbook is just fire the CEO as a way to show the street that you're, that's kind of step one in the playbook, uh, to show the street that you're serious. But it's not really a long-term damaging event for the organization or the shareholders. The small mid-market space does not experience that the same way. To the example you called out with the, the medical device, a uh, medical records company, uh, the Small Business Administration shows the stats show that 71% of those companies are still owned uh, by their founder, uh, and the net worth on the beige book is a little over seven trillion. A lot of those folks are looking to transition those companies as uh, an intergenerational transfer, uh, sell the company, and put that into retirement plan. Uh, but those the, the demographics there are very very baby boomer focused. Uh, the risk to that wealth transfer to that you know lifetime worth of work, if you will, is 60% of the companies who suffer a major data breach in the SMB go out of business within six months and 80% within 18. Uh, to the example you offered, uh, the cost of cleaning up the breach, the litigations, the second wave uh, losses, they did, the organization simply can't bear it. They just do not have the financial resiliency they don't have the deep pockets of a Target or a Home Depot or an Equifax or an Anthem scenario. They simply don't have the resources to do it. Uh, and as a result, it's it's effectively a kill shot uh, for the business. So the the landscape and kind of the the Equifax and the Target get all the ink. Uh, reporters love big nameplates, big numbers, 120 million records. That's going to sell a lot of newspapers and get a lot of clicks on on news sites. The FBI crime statistics tell a very different story. I mean, it's the vast majority of the losses are happening, 90 plus percent from the numbers I've seen, are happening in the mid market. That's where the financial damage is being done. Well, oh, can you can you define just real quick what you consider the mid market as far as a, a revenue range of businesses? Yeah, the the numbers. That's yeah, that's a great point. Uh, a lot of folks, it's a pretty big envelope. Uh, the, the statistics that I'm saying are mostly 
they cut that line at about 500 million and below and under 250 employees. Uh, ADP, as an example there, would say that uh, more than 50% of America's payroll flows through companies with less than 250 million employees, uh, less than 250 million in revenue and less than 250 employees. Uh, and that represents, just as a quick you know, cyber crime example, that's where the bulk of the payroll W-2 uh, employee cyber theft uh, crime happens is in those smaller companies. It's, it's pretty difficult to hack a Fortune 500's employee record system. Not so much, you know, a manufacturing company with, with 50 employees. Uh, that's, so that's, hopefully that definition helps. Well, I, I, I guess, you know, given the statistics, I can see how this is an existential threat to, you know, those type of companies. But they're, they're, these are companies also that are large enough that many of them would have a, either a robust IT team in place, and I would also imagine that they have, at least most of them would have some sort of security software to defend against these types of attack. So are you, are you saying that those are not adequate steps to meet the threat? I would say that the, the threat, the, the global stats would, would say no. Uh, what we're seeing is that the offensive capability of the, the black hat, the bad actor, is growing at a rate significantly faster than what organizations are investing in how they're progressing. So one of the key metrics that we look at is detection. How quickly can an organization understand uh, whether they've been compromised? So if you look at FireEye, which is one of the top threat analytic firms in the world, they would the statistics there indicate that in the enterprise space, the network compromise to detection window from when they have an issue is detected to when they can discover it, remediate it, and flush it out of the back is about 120 days. Uh, really advanced firms that have very sophisticated uh, threat analytics and what they call hunter teams can detect uh, threats, isolate them, and get them out of the network in hours. Uh, so that's a very good indicator as to the sophistication and capability of a team. In the SMB, as we defined a little bit earlier, those numbers go up to about 350 days. So it's not uncommon for small mid-market companies to be owned for almost a year, and they rarely find out from their internal team. 80% uh, plus of notifications about a compromise don't come from inside the organization. Uh, they come from a third party, a credit card processor, an, an affected partner. Uh, it's very, very common. Uh, up to about 80% of those issues really are kind of beyond the organizational authority of IT. I think that's one of the other really big misconceptions that we deal with is uh, this is a technology issue, therefore it's IT's fault, IT's problem, and IT needs to do this. Uh, I, I, could, I travel all over the country, talk to a thousand CEOs in the mid-market a year. One of the core messages I do is this is the CEO's issue. You cannot abdicate your authority to IT, and IT cannot fix this. Um, IT does not have the organizational authority to do the things that need to be done to shore up an organization's cybersecurity posture. I think the second really big challenge that we find, even when we stay inside the IT role description, is a lot of confusion uh, about the difference between a red team and a blue team. So unpack that really quickly. Uh, a blue team, uh, as defined in kind of the DOD protocols, the blue team is essentially like the New York City Police Department. They have a really big job. They have uh, homicide, vice, narcotics, uh, traffic enforcement, counterterrorism, the Macy's Day Parade, but they're an enforcement function there to make the city run smoothly. I think IT operations is much the same way. They are a, there to service the customer, keep the operation profitable, functioning, uh, create business value. A red team, by contrast, is much like a, a SEAL team, uh, and as Maria pains me to say that, but they are trained to shoot, move, and communicate uh, with advanced tactics and weapons, uh, and they have a very different mission. Uh, both are responsible to some extent for security. They just do it in very different ways. Now, I, I, the biggest confusion point we run into is most CEOs, most senior leaders don't understand that distinction. So they take what is essentially an operations and enforcement function, like the New York Police Department, and they try to send it on offensive combat operations like it was a SEAL team or yell and scream at them when they get uh, compromised or have an issue 
when they weren't trained, equipped uh, to have red team capabilities. Uh, and I think this is really critical. Uh, the blue team uh, cannot do the red team's job. Uh, and to some extent, it carries into even uh, grading your own homework type of behaviors. Uh, if I'm an IT blue team operator and I'm responsible to grade my own homework and determine whether my network is safe, um, you're going to have just, you know, confirmation bias, blind spots don't get found. And most senior executives immediately recognize they would never accept a CFO auditing their own books. Yet when you say IT gets to grade its own homework and audit itself year after year after year, or just say to management, uh, yeah, we got this, don't worry about it. Um, when you put it in financial context, everybody agrees it's kind of ridiculous. So versus a more traditional structure of just IT, yours, could, you, could you detail more how that would look in an organizational sense? Sure. Uh, I mean, if you look at the enterprise models, it's become very common for organizations to split this red team, blue team reality uh, into a CIO's role, which is more traditional blue team, make the trains run on time, create business value, help automate the business, reduce operating expenses, kind of classical IT uh, success factors, and then have an office of a chief information security officer, a CISO, whose primary mission and the team capabilities that he or she builds are focused exclusively on securing the organization. Uh, and there's been different experiments in different organizations, but what's kind of shaking out and becoming more common is that the CISO reports directly up into the CEO or in some cases, into the audit committee at the board level, uh, they don't report into the CIO. So these are uh, a mated pair or a kind of a, a counterbalance to each other, if you will, that captures the unique requirements of each role. Now, that's not practical economically for a lot of mid-market companies. It's simply beyond their budget. Uh, so what we find as a, as a mid-market equivalent is a fairly common technique is to outsource uh, the IT operations is done by one team and the security is done by another. And then there's a, the red team is keeping the blue team honest kind of approach. And both sides are, are given a, a fighting shot at winning uh, because staying current and dealing with all of the changes that come at the operators in these various disciplines is daunting. Uh, I can say from, you know, being in the red team space and on the cybersecurity side of the house, uh, you know, we get we receive hundreds of bulletins a day on new threats and new things and new techniques and things we have to stay on top of. There, there's it, the ability for a singular department without role specialization to do both jobs from one resource base is is just not realistic. So how you source it, that's a business decision. But having the two different capabilities, I don't really think that's an option anymore. Well, it also leads me to, to, to think that um, given the amount of information that uh, is, is, is ported in every day, this, the sheer size of it, how does a red team go about determining uh, what is a threat? I, I mean, I, I have to get to a point where there's so much data going through that you can't read every email. Are you looking for patterns? Uh, you know, what, what, what is kind of their modus operandi? So I think it's important to uh, understand that it's a partnership. Uh, I'm going to use a, so you're using data flowing in and out of the organization. As an example, one of the, one of the major threats that we see in a, a source of substantial financial loss, uh, and there's different variants of this, but uh, the CEO email scam, where a CEO uh, email box is compromised or a phony email looks like it comes from the CEO, goes to a controller, financial person, they issue some financial instructions, uh, the folks go ahead and execute that wire transfer and it turns out to be fraudulent. We call that risk factor money in motion. Uh, fake invoices, amended wire instruction transfers, uh, those all come into the organization through standard systems uh, like wire transfer, like banking interfaces, like email, whatnot. The blue team clearly has responsibility to own. But they may not recognize or may not have access into, hey, there's been a 500% uptick in this particular variant of wire fraud. And here's examples of what they look like uh, to train the users so that they're not as easily tricked. Uh, I think there's that back and forth in terms of 
there are very predictable risk factors. There are very predictable loss uh, uh, points in an organization. Uh, employee insider threat, you know, 60 plus percent of employees steal data before they quit. Uh, well, there can be patterns laid into an environment where somebody downloads their entire email box. That's a pretty strong indicator that they would probably intend to quit in the near future because that's not a normal behavior for a engaged, happy employee. So I think there's different uh, threat vectors, different threat profiles that uh, a team, a red team, a blue team working together can start to create countermeasures and start to create mitigation strategy. I think at a larger level, uh, what does winning look like uh, in terms of cyber risk management? We, we have a bright line standard. It kind of came out of the Wyndham case in which uh, Wyndham had been breached three times. The uh, Federal Trade Commission filed a sanction against them. Wyndham's management team uh, did not believe that sanction was justified, challenged it in federal court, and the uh, federal court came back, heard the case. This is where that Pandora's box of piercing the corporate veil, that was kind of a titanic shift in, in thought process came from. The uh, court heard the case to pierce the corporate veil and said, in this case, we're gonna rule in the favor of management and we will not allow that to happen. However, uh, we two other things that came out of that. One is we're not gonna judge companies by wins and losses. And they cited specifically that Sony and JP Morgan were the victims of nation state level attacks. Uh, and the thought process behind that is kind of like any given Sunday. I mean, any company could end up taking on somebody a thousand times their size and capability. Uh, so winning and losing isn't really a fair standard when it comes to cyber, cyber operations. The, what you can't hold them accountable to is how do you play the game? And the, the top uh, 10 here that are offered are what the court said are kind of a bright line standard. If you're doing these 10 things, this is what we found as the compelling rationale that Wyndham, in fact, did have a credible cybersecurity program and was, in fact, acting in good faith. Mm -hmm. what, what that offers us as a community, right, is we can then say uh, this becomes a safe harbor provision, if you will, or a bright line standard using kind of more legal language. These are the 10 elements that a cyber program has to have. Now, looking at this, there's not a lot in here that the IT team actually owns. Uh, they can help with data mapping. Um, cyber insurance is a risk management function. Uh, Third-party cybersecurity due diligence, that's again, something your validation and your red team should be doing. Uh, logging capability, forensics, outside legal. Uh, these, these are all things that are management driven and not really typically within the purview or even authority of, of a senior IT practitioner. Uh, most states, the CIO is not um, considered a corporate officer, uh, and many of these items would be managed or handled by a CFO or the CEO directly. So I think it's important as we as we come into this, we can say that this is more than IT can handle, but I think once you start to look at the bright line standard of what we need to be doing to prove out and have a credible cyber program, I, I would argue it becomes very quick, very clear, very quick that this is beyond you know, the authority of what most senior IT practitioners can do in an organization. Well, you know, Ken, you, you, you touched on one thing here that I want to circle back to, um, and this kind of harks back to the, the, the exposure that the uh, executive level has to improperly handling data. Um, uh, these 10 steps, I understand, would mitigate some of that risk, but insurance being a key function of that, can you tell me a little about what that cyber insurance looks like and what it takes for a firm to, to qualify to be able to get that? It's a great question. Uh, I think it would be fair to say cyber risk is a, a rapidly emerging market in the U.S. Uh, at a global level, not so much. I, I think there's some carriers uh, like CFCs, like top-rated carrier globally, uh, has been for several years now. They've been writing standalone cyber insurance policies for 16 years. But I think there's a difference between uh, the U.S. market and the international market, but I think the U.S. market is catching up very quickly. Uh, there are different kinds of policies. There are, I always say, two super categories that are useful to understand. One is a, a true standalone cyber policy that has both third and first party elements. And there's what we call tack-on or bolt-on policies, where it's an extension of an existing instrument. 
Uh, example there would be, it's a bolt onto your E&O or it's a bolt onto your general liability. Uh, the, the, the best way I've ever heard cyber insurance described was by the chief risk officer for CBC is that based on their 15 years of actuarial data, they said it most closely represents water abatement. Uh, if anybody's had water in their basement knows that uh, nothing good happens from standing water. It wrecks the carpet, wicks into the walls. Uh, you got to get that water taken care of and you got to get taken care of quickly. Uh, so one of the key characteristics we see that differentiates insurance, whether they really get cyber or not, is their ability to operate in what we call cyber time. It's just lightning speed. Uh, most of the damage will be done in the first 72 hours. So uh, policies that have a standalone policy is always preferred where you can get it. And then what you're really working there with your insurance carrier and whatnot is to build uh, a rapid response capability that keeps a small problem small. Uh, so one of the key differentiators we look for is we help you know, company kind of navigate this discussion is, can I get a 1-800 number response with a dedicated incident management uh, team with an incident coach uh, that I'm not penalized for using? If the carrier says, yeah, you'll get an adjuster that will call you back in 72 hours to start the claim process, uh, I would strongly advise reconsidering that carrier or that policy because a lot of the damage will have been done at that point. It will be too late. So I think the elite carriers have understood that this, you know, cyber has an analog in the physical world. Uh, and if they can cap you know, capitalize on their experience in dealing with you know, water abatement type of issues, uh, their programs uh, reward customers for calling early, uh, keeping small problems small, uh, and moving very aggressively to contain these problems so that they don't get out of hand. Uh, the other insurance factor that I think we're starting to see come into the market that will uh, will definitely change how this gets bought in the next two to three years is we're starting to see insurance carriers copying the success in like a workers' compensation recapture model in which a really well-run worker safety uh, zero-day OSHA type of uh, approach reduces everyone's cost. And they allow the car the carrier will pay back to the insured a recapture element of the, the proceeds and the savings that they generated through having a really really well managed uh, worker safety program. Uh, we're starting to see the front line of those kind of programs coming into the cyberspace as well, in which now most senior management teams I, I interact with they're more interested in expanding their coverage than they are lowering their premiums. Uh, but either way, right, I mean, it's the insured is getting a benefit from uh, actively managed intelligent program that coordinates with their carrier. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, I, I, I understand. And, and, it's, and, it, and I guess I'm also a little intimidated by this. I can see that, you know, getting getting the insurance once is a, is a big step. And then I'm sure they're going to enforce all the standards that are on that, that list of 10. But in your experience, how many people sign up for insurance and then lose it because they don't maintain that system? Uh, it's not difficult to get insurance. I think a lot of people, if it is really difficult, then you're probably dealing with the wrong carrier. Uh, the second part, though, is about 60% of the time, they won't be able to renew. And the idea that, unfortunately, many, many senior corporate officers have is they can essentially, quote, unquote, paper this problem over and just transfer the risk to the insurance carrier. Uh, bad news for that thought process is underwriters get paid and they're professionals too. And they'll write a paper, they'll write a policy in a first year, but if you're not making any progress on any of the elements and you're not training your employees, you're not doing program uh, plan, you're not moving forward on the critical 10, then you just represent an un unreasonable risk and they'll, they'll just refuse to renewal. Uh, the other, you know, out, unfortunate outcome, right, is uh, first bite free type of thought process comes into place. And they write the paper, they charge you a premium, you have a claim, uh, then that becomes claims experience. And they either, you know, 60% of the time refuse to renew you, or the 40% they do, you're going to see a massive increase in your premiums. And in many cases, it's just cheaper to do the right thing. I mean, 
yeah, I, I, the way I position that is your first year of cyber insurance is more or less a bridging, it's a defensive posture, a bridging exercise to cover you against the bad, the worst case scenario, why you get your cyber program up and running. It is not a long-term solution. It's it's a bridging strategy. Well, that makes sense. And and, and I you, you said it's it's cheaper to do the right thing. I, and, and I guess I'm gonna push back on that a little bit because it's doing the right thing to maintain your insurance rates, but there seems to be a very large investment overall, especially for you know, the small to mid-sized firms. What kind of structure have you seen with companies, both organizationally and financially? Uh, I think in the mid-market, uh, outsourcing approach tends to be the most common. Holding a lot of red team capacity is just not financially realistic for most mid-market firms. You're going to have to partner for this. Uh, having your IT operations, if you've outsourced IT operations, and then that person then tells you, yeah, we'll go ahead and secure your infrastructure as well. That's something that should cause some alarm bells. There's a bit of an ethical issue there uh, in which, you know, if I have a network engineer who's managing my network as an outsourced partner is then having his best friend come over and grade my homework. Uh, I've been in that space for a number of years and, and a decade where we're working with MSPs. I've never had one bring forward a self-disclosure report that says they screwed up on their security of a client and then disclose that to a client. Never seen it. Um, they're not going to put the contract at risk. So they're going to having that by a third party. I think is absolutely crucial. Uh, even from a, just an ethics standpoint, uh, we tell customers we can either be a, a managed services uh, security partner uh, or an owner, but we can't be in operations and in security. Uh, it's just a conflict of interest. So structurally, I think that red team blue team has to take on some contractual rigor. It, it cannot all live in a wonder house. And anybody selling economies or selling that it's better for you as the buyer um, either doesn't understand the issue or I would argue is being somewhat disingenuous. I think the, the second part of your question in terms of the cost piece and is this really cost prohibitive, uh, I think we've had some very, very favorable developments. I think three, four years ago, some of the technologies that we would use in the enterprise space were absolutely not within the reach of uh, the mid-market. I think that complaint would have been very fair. I, over the last three years, we've seen a huge influx of investment, technology partners. Uh, one analyst report I read said there was 5,800 new cybersecurity solutions that came on the market last year alone. So we're seeing a massive infusion of technological uh, innovation and capability, and that is having a significant downward pressure on prices. Uh, tools that you know used to be uh, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year are are now down in that five to seven range. So I, I think we're going to see that's a pot, I mean, not a great trend, right? I mean, you're seeing margin pressures and commoditization uh, convergence is starting to happen on the cybersecurity tool provider space. Not great for them, but good for the consumer. So I think accessibility and affordability of what we call the weapons locker is, is going to get a lot. It is, is already much better than it was two years ago. Uh, it's going to get a lot better over the next two years. Uh, the other thing, I think, as we get more data and we learn more about how to do this well, uh, we're seeing huge uh, upticks in good behaviors. So I'll give you an example. I had one firm we were working with to get them underwritten with their insurance carrier, and we got two quotes back. Uh, the first was for $15,000. The second was for exactly half that at about $7,500. And... Uh, the difference in the quote was deployment of BitLocker on their Windows 10 machines to establish encryption of data at rest. That's a core capability operating system that didn't require the company to spend any additional resources uh, other than just some IT time. And the second was buying a security awareness training package from a no before Wombat that cost you know, 20 to 28 bucks a user. Uh, they ran all their users through that training. Uh, significantly improved and had a active cyber education program. Uh, it's 28 bucks a user is not a significant cost factor for a lot of organizations. And in the size of this particular company, they paid for the deployment of both solutions just in the difference in the insurance premiums. So 
financial, I think there's some of these things where if you know what you're looking for and how to look for it uh, and how you put these programs together, there's a lot of found money in some of these circumstances. So the, the last point there is you have to look at the assets you're trying to protect. Uh, anybody who looks at cybersecurity and just says it's all cost, I think fundamentally misunderstands that the primary role of security is to defend assets. Uh, and a counter example I offer is had an engineering firm with $150 million of assets, digital assets in, the, in an AutoCAD environment, and they were spending almost nothing to defend that asset base. And I said, what's the cost basis? You know, if I was to bring in a risk manager and say, what percentage of this asset would you consider to be a reasonable spend in the maintenance and defense of this asset, according to the Association of Risk Managers? And he handed me back a percentage. I said, you do understand that's that that number, which is about $400,000 in that particular case, isn't anywhere in your IT budget and nobody's ever brought forward an appropriation for security software of that asset. So you're talking about cost, but you're not even doing basic asset evaluation and basic asset defense. Uh, that's where we stumble into the into the grossly negligent category uh, where, where management starts to get themselves into trouble is we're not even spending industry standard defensive percentages of what the assets are worth. Ken, the, just before we leave the, the structure thing, what have you seen in, in your experience of the relationship between the CIO and the CISO? Um, are they on equal terms as far as, as reporting to the CEO or you know, is it a partnership or does one have to have the ability to trump the other? What, what have you seen? Uh, it's a great question. And I think there's a couple of different variants of this. Uh, the one that was deployed initially when the CISO role first started coming out, uh, becoming prevalent in corporate structures was to have that role report to the CIO. I think that with the red team, blue team conflict and, now the blue team is issuing orders to the red team who's supposed to be holding them accountable. I think people learned very quickly that that was a bad idea. Uh, whether they both report to the CI, CEO directly or the CISO reports into the audit committee uh, on the board is, I think, more uh, driven by the size of the organization and how they view the role of the audit committee. Uh, sure, a, a cute story of uh, uh, a red team, blue team combination uh, CEO brought his two leaders into the into the office and said, uh, if I ever found out that you said anything nice about each other, you had lunch or show any indications of liking each other, I'll fire you both on the spot. Um, <laughs> so it, 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 the basic point he was driving at in a somewhat humorous way is uh, this is intended to be a separation of powers. Uh, there is There should be some tension to some extent between the red team trying to keep the organization safe and the IT blue team trying to keep the organization efficient and profitable. Uh, there is an inherent tension there. And if the roles are being done correctly, they shouldn't always agree. Uh, and they're going to bring forward their arguments. They're bringing forward the case that they're making. Uh, and CISOs are paid to be paranoid and see risk everywhere. And IOs, a good IO is paid to see opportunity and how to, you know, how to make the business more efficient and more profitable. Uh, and they're going to have their perspectives. They should differ, and uh, they should be bringing those those differences forward to the senior decision maker or the board, and let the senior officers make the decision on which side they want to land from risk versus opportunity. So it's a partnership, but it's designed to have a, a separation of powers and distinct viewpoints. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, Ken, you know, with your background, I'm hearing a lot of uh, military references. And as you and I have kind of talked through before, this reflects the sobering attitude that you have about this threat. But can you share your views uh, on why you see this in military terms and why you are such a strong supporter of, veteran, uh, of the veteran community in this role? Absolutely. Uh, one of the quips in our shop is uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the members of my team are, are former special forces operators. Uh, and one of our quips is that it's easier to train a warfighter in technology than it is to train a technologist in warfighting. Uh, 
a large part of our population, if I was to go to a grocery store, a coffee shop, a church, uh, you know, any kind of context, after World War II, I'd have a one in four chance of meeting a combat veteran. Uh, in today's society, less than 7% of the population served in the military and less than 1% of that population have been forward deployed and see combat time. Uh, by contrast, if you were to go take a look at like Israel, as an example, between your graduation from high school and your moving on to uh, college, they spend one year of mandatory service in civil defense. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody's being trained to, you know, be a SEAL or a recon Marine and run offensive combat operations, but they're trained in basic civil defense. They're trained in uh, a lot of security context uh, and concepts and techniques because they live in a world where the corner coffee shop could uh, blow up at any time. And they've made a decision at a social level to make sure that they have a trained uh, general population. Now, I'm not when people freak out, I'm not advocating the draft. I'm just calling out the fact that uh, we have a smaller and smaller percentage of our community that have that kind of training. Uh, you don't get it in high school. You don't get it in college. I meet a lot of very successful, well-adjusted, financially independent uh, leadership uh, uh, across the country, none of which has ever seen anything bad happen. They've never been exposed to any kind of security training. And as a result, they're incredibly naive as to the threat they're up against. Um, they lack situational awareness. They don't understand basic principles of defense, uh, countermeasures, defense in depth. They just uh, violence of action. They don't understand any of the things that a, a military operator would understand. Uh, what we found is that former law enforcement and former military are, are exceptionally good in cybersecurity because they have that contextual awareness, and especially if they've been in a combat element. And in the immortal words of the great philosopher Mike Tyson, uh, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Uh, and when you start to, you understand that reality and you've been in a, you've been in a scrape before, you understand that there's a different thought process that has to go into place when you start talking about security and securing assets. Uh, we've got a partnership with Metro State University back in my home state, Minnesota. Uh, they're one of the centers for cyber excellence across the country. And they're training a hundred veterans in cybersecurity roles, um, as part of the first wave of putting uh, former military personnel into the, the cyber roles. Uh, so I think there's, they bring a lot to the table in that space. And we just don't have a lot of uh, venues in our culture where people are getting that kind of training outside of the military. So I think they bring a lot of value to the cyber fight. Uh, and I also think, uh, you know, all of us that were in that capacity raised our right hand and took the, took the oath. Uh, to defend from enemies foreign and domestic. And that's a, that's a big part of the world that we come from. And you don't ever unring the bell when it comes to that oath. You took the oath and it's with you for life. So I think the, having a different mission where you're doing that a different way, uh, that community has demonstrated, uh, time and time again that they're going to live into that promise. Uh, so I think you know, leveraging that uh, commitment to service, commitment to protection, uh, equipping them for the cyber mission and bringing them forward is a great asset that uh, the corporate you know, community can benefit from significantly. Well, that makes a lot of sense, and it would probably be an appropriate time for me to pause here and say thank you for your service. Uh, and I can understand why I would prefer to have a red team that has that, you know, seek and destroy attitude all the time. I, that would be so that they could easily leverage into this fight. So, well, I think too, Bob. One one last point there, quickly. I, I think is uh, as that red team who brings that forward to a blue team, uh, you have a conversation. If I was going to attack you, this is how I do it, and this is how I take your defense apart. Uh, that's incredibly valuable to the blue team because right? they get to go to work then and start shoring up those weaknesses. So I think it's it's that. Um, being, we desperately need both, uh, people who are really good at setting up the defense and then interacting with people who are really good at taking it apart. Um, that's where the real win-win happens. And I assume that would be some of the mandate that the red team would have is not only are they, they are looking for threats, but they're also probing their own systems to find out where the vulnerabilities are and, and, and trying to see where they would strike first if they were a, a black hat. 
Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. That's going back to the CEO joke. I, I don't want to hear you guys saying anything nice, thing nice about each other or find out you like each other, right? Because you start pulling punches and you start rounding them off, then the blue team isn't getting a fair shake either. Well, that makes sense. All right. Well, you can also see how all of this is very intimidating for organizations, both financially and structurally. And, you know, there, there is so much sensitive data that we're handling daily and having, you know, direct connectivity with our team members, clients, and providers, it seems a bit overwhelming problem to manage and the consequences are so severe. You know, where do we start? Uh, I would say like any other business challenge, uh, it starts at, at the top. Um, the CEO, senior leadership has to step back and uh, acknowledge that and kind of just get on board with the, that this is an organizational issue that requires senior leadership's attention and they can't delegate the responsibility and all of the consequences to an IT function uh, because they're misconceptualizing the problem as being technical. That's the first step. Uh, until that happens, honestly, uh, it's just going to be counting the time until the consequence set is realized uh, because IT is just not to previous conversation points is just not equipped to do this. So that's step one is you got to get senior leadership to recognize. And I take this message to CEOs all over the world. This is your problem. The court has made that clear. The fact that they're prepared to come after your personal financial assets for negligence in this area. I, I don't know of any other business function where a CEO could be exposed to personal financial loss if a business function fails. So, so um, I understand. Delegated. That, I'm go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Delegate it to your own risk. Once you get that done, then and that's on board. Then from there, it's I would suggest it's like fixing any other business function. You have to get a baseline analysis, figure out where you're at, figure out what you need, do a gap analysis, and build a program plan to fix it. And not like just similar from any you know sales function or manufacturing function that's underperforming. All right, and. Um, you know, on the, the current slide that we have up, we have you know, the, the steps that you see going forward. Can you talk a little bit about beef, uh, no before and wombat and, and why that's a critical step? Uh, what we've found is that uh, organizations that invest in security awareness training, and it, there's other ones out there, but I, the ones I work with primarily are, are no before and wombat, they are based on a very simple premise that most adult learners uh, only remember about 7% of what you tell them in a classroom setting. Uh, so what these type of tools do is they run security uh, training. So they'll, they'll run a phishing attack or they'll run a uh, compliance style at uh, attack, if you will, against the organization as part of the campaign. What's really brilliant about these tools is that it gives the end user a chance to fail in a safe manner. Uh, so the feedback is immediate. Hey, yeah, I clicked on the link or hey, yeah, I clicked on this bogus wire transfer uh, and I get to fail and the, the tool is tricking me in the same manner that I would see a real threat. And then it then provides me feedback to let me know that I did not, in fact, uh, pass the test, but then offers me just in time training to help me make sure I don't make mistake mistake again. Uh, what's really cool is I've seen organizations gamify this and it gets to be really fun where uh, you know, finance is competing against AT to see who can get the better score, and HR is trying to beat both of them. And it becomes, you know, who can be the most cyber aware department inside of a company. Uh, and it, it can, I've seen it, but if it's done well, I've seen it completely transform a cybersecurity awareness program. Uh, like, and the culture just becomes way more on top of what's going on. If users are educated and empowered and brought forward as part of the solution instead of being the, the major source of the problem, uh, then I think you can see enormous changes in a company's cyber posture for 25, 20 bucks a user. I mean, that's not an unreasonable investment. Uh, so that would be, I think, one of the, the, the very first low-cost, super high-impact things that, that should be put in place. And we, this is to point it out earlier, we, we've seen insurance premiums. Uh, most of the underwriters I talk to for most of the carriers, they are very, very favorable to seeing their, and they price differently when they see these things in place. 
well, kind of related to that that previous question, uh, something that we've gotten from our audience coming in, they w wanted you to comment on the, the state of analytics and AI-based automated cybersecurity, both for enterprise as well as small business. It's a great, it's a great question, and it's an emerging capability. Uh, so I would say uh, I, uh, I'm an optimistic pessimist. So I, I, uh, I, I have high hopes for what this can do for us, and I think where artificial intelligence has a lot to bring to the party is what we call faster than human response. Uh, I have no doubt in, in three years' time it will be uh, white hat, black hat AI uh, fighting each other in, in cyberspace because human beings simply cannot react fast enough. There's no doubt in my mind that's coming. So the flip side of that coin, though, is that uh, uh, Joe Sixpack or Susie SUV is still going to get the amended wire fraud transfer and accidentally wire, you know, 200 grand to a bad actor, regardless of whether we have artificial intelligence or not. The human factor will not be removed from this simply because we have bot on bot combat in cyberspace. Uh, people are still going to screw up. People are still going to do things. And, uh, you know, God bless the R and D teams that are out there coming up with all this amazing technology. Uh, you, you never want to bring a knife to a gunfight. Uh, so everything we can do to build out the weapons locker. I tell, I tell SEALs this all the time. The good guys have to get it right every single day, every single time. The bad guys only have to get it right once. So anything we can do from a technology standpoint to level the playing field, uh, I, I think it's a good addition to the discussion. But HR policy manuals, insider threat, employees stealing data before they quit, um, artificial intelligence isn't going to remove the need for good management good senior management engagement, good policies that are, you know, both enforced at a, at a human level and at a technical controls level. Um, the last cautionary note, there's as optimistic and as cool as I am, I think this stuff is, it, there's a danger in that we start to believe that the technology will solve the problem. And we've been down that road before. It, it never, I mean, the technology in the security space has gotten better every single year and the problem's getting worse, not better. Um, it's not for lack of cool technology. It's we're still trying to pr pretend that there's a magic technical silver bullet, and it's just never going to happen. All right. Well, I'm going to step into the punch here. Then, um, what are, what are your thoughts on blockchain technology? Uh, it's again, I think one of those areas where uh, working with food distribution systems as clients, like cargo, and, and uh, some of those the ability to track food. The ability to inter interject blockchain technology into that security of our food supply, critical infrastructure, um, transactional security. Again, I think it's an enormously powerful technology that has a ton of promise. Uh, but you know, we had the largest the the Manila transfer inside of our SWIFT system from the Federal Reserve to a bank in Manila to the tune of 800 million dollars. Uh, I think most of the people who designed SWIFT would argue it's probably one of the most secure uh, transfer systems ever designed uh, by humankind. That was all compromised by a human factor. Uh, an inside actor was compromised. Uh, they injected uh, the ability to monitor and maintain uh, observational capability into that system. They spent a year learning how to do it exactly the way it was supposed to do waited for an opportunity to move $800 million and then defeated one of the best, most technically and logically advanced control systems the banking industry had ever built. Um, I don't think blockchain is any different. I think at a technical level, it's brilliant. I think it has enormous potential and promise, but I have absolute confidence it will be undermined by the human factor, just like every other technical solution. Um, people are always the weakest link and um, it's, Without those controls at the human level, um, the best technology, technology solution on the planet still can be compromised. All right. Well, let me uh, um, kind of wrap up uh, with a you know, final question that's it's a little more practical. Um, you know, I, we, we understand now that the threat is real, the liability is huge, and you've got to you, you give us a framework on which we could build on. 
but how do I sell this to my boss? How, if, if you went into an organization that is just starting to see this as an imminent threat to them, how would you present it and how would you pitch it? It's a great question. And the way that I start with is for thousands of years, all security has been based on the value of the assets we're required to protect. Uh, when the Hope Diamond travels, you're going to see a lot of lasers, guards, and guns. Uh, if I'm moving cash, uh, you know, we got Brinks trucks. I think we just instinctively understand when we look at physical analogs that the value of what it is that we're trying to protect is going to have a justified level of investment. And what I see most IT teams and what I see most people get wrong is they start to talk about, you know, celebrating the problem, selling the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and there's all this bad stuff out there. Uh, I'm more of a just, hey, let's talk about the value of the assets and what we're trying to protect. Uh, any good operator is going to look at this and say, uh, tell me what I have to work with and tell me what I have to defend. What's the mission? And then well, I can come back with a reasonable request for what I need to make that happen. What I see people get wrong is they try to focus on the wrong side of the equation. Uh, what is the data worth? Uh, how many wire transfers do we do a week, a month, a year? What's the total money in motion that flows through that particular apparatus? Uh, wire fraud. Uh, is the most single, uh, the single largest loss in most environments. So what would happen if we lost an average wire transfer? And, you know, that number could be anywhere from, tw you know, $25,000 to two and a half million. Uh, I've had organizations that do $100 million in wire transfers. There's no investment of any security around that process or that risk factor. Uh, so it's kind of the, my simple answer, my somewhat cynical answer is to say, uh, the golden rule, uh, whoever owns the gold makes the rules. Uh, follow the gold. Where's the money? Uh, and if you have major corporate assets, whether those be digital assets or money in motion or payroll liability or wherever the money is flowing, that's where the risk is. So build your budget, build your proposal, build your solution uh, around the defense of the corporate crown jewels. And, you know, cash is the lifeblood of any company. So anything you can do to help shore up security around that, uh, it, that's going to be your best chance to sell, you know, I, what I would call, you know, business case driven, intelligent investment. Well, Ken, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to revise myself. We, we've received another um, audience question that uh, um, is also well into the practical world, but I wanted to run by you, you know, based on your experience, how mature is the supply chain in cyber and data security? And, and what is it doing to, being done by companies to manage that business? So clarifying question on the question uh, is how, how mature is uh, like the Fortune 1000 supply chain or the, the cybersecurity companies as part of the supply chain? Which one are they asking about? Well, let, let, let's assume it's Fortune 1000. So uh, I, I think this is uh, the, the Fazio mechanical uh, storyline uh, being the base of operation, being a small mid-market $25 million HVAC mechanical is used as the base of operation to take down target and be the source of the kill chain in that breach is a well-known, well-documented story. Uh, I know some supply chain managers who, who like to use that term Fazio as a verb. Uh, they don't want to be fazioed. Uh, if you look at the last 14 major enterprise level breaches, they all come through the supply chain. Uh, not one of them came through the front door, so to speak. Uh, they all come through the soft underbelly of the supply chain. I know at a CISO conference I was at, uh, one of the goals was to eliminate up to one third of the supply chain uh, based off of cyber readiness. Uh, I know that there's, we're, we're probably going to see over the next two to three years uh, more robust cybersecurity questionnaires coming from larger organizations trying to manage that risk. Another technique I know for a fact they're already starting to use is to raise the insurance limits, uh, insurance requirements, where you know there may not have been a requirement at all or it was a relatively low-level requirement like $1 million. In two to three years, I think we'll see those at be at two to three million and ultimately up in the $5 million range. Uh, and they're going to use the insurance carriers as another, you know, ally, if you will, in enforcing cybersecurity posture improvements in the small and mid-market, or they simply won't be a supplier to that, that Fortune 1000 base anymore. Uh, 
Now that that seems, you know, hey, that's a potential loss of revenue. That seems all uh, negative and doom and gloom. You know, kind of being a marine, I see the offensive side of that. Uh, I tell CEOs all the time, if you didn't hear the cash register ring, then you weren't listening properly. Uh, that can become a significant competitive differentiator, competitive advantage, such that uh, your ability to demonstrate to organizations that you have a capable, competent, robust cybersecurity posture makes you the vendor of choice. Uh, that will absolutely be a competitive differentiator in the next two to three years. So I think it's it's a drag race uh, that's gonna you know have winners and losers to be sure, but uh, the ability to uh, work with one company actually who ran a marketing campaign in HubSpot that was triggered off the cybersecurity incidents related to competitors. Um, you know the the marketing piece is worried about your cybersecurity posture. Time to have a conversation. <laughs> it's like wow, okay, that's taking the offensive side of this to to a, to a fine edge, but uh, there, there's little doubt in my mind that this, you know, large organizations are very, very concerned about their supply chain risk uh, and the ability to demonstrate that you're a reliable, uh, capable, competent partner in the cybersecurity space to your tier one organizations uh, can be a very lucrative uh, exercise for many companies. Well, Ken, I, I think we're we're about out of time here, but uh, I want to start first by you know thanking you for not only the information that you shared with everybody, but your time today. It's been enlightening, and, and quite frankly, I think we could go on for an, at least another hour. I'd also like to thank our audience for for you know tuning in today and sending over questions. I will let you know that we'll have uh, transcripts of this full webinar uh, available in about 24 hours. In addition, uh, we're going to provide uh, Ken's contact information so you can reach out to him in case you got, uh, have some additional questions that we did not cover. He's a, obviously a very, very great uh, resource. Uh, we'll supply that uh, email address. I'll, I can tell you very quickly, it's, it's ken.barnhart at highgroundcyber.com, but we'll also have that available to everybody else afterwards. Um, but again, thank you for your participation uh, in the webinar. And Ken, thank you for your time and your insight. Happy to help. Good luck. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you again for joining Profit Recovery Partners and McDermott and Bull for Security on the Superhighway, Cybersecurity Risk Assessment and Compliance. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.